And we have some special guests here to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance if they would please come up. You want to tell us who's up here? Yeah. All right. So, leading us in the pledge, um, I want you all to just introduce yourself. Tell us what grade you're in. How about where they're from, too? Oh, yeah. Right. Well, yeah. We're from the Pride Union on the first day of the outside of action. Carson Boggs, senior, and I live right outside of Rector. I'm Austin Hanson. I'm a senior, and I live in Edgecombe. So these were our students of the month, and um, after doing the pledge, we'll, um, we'll talk a little about each student and then some others that couldn't join us. Okay, I'm all. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God. Indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Yeah, I'll go ahead and do these first. Let's go ahead and do these out of the way. Um, uh, Mr. Jeff Smith. Yes. Uh, I was here a few months ago talking about CRT, uh, critical race theory, and the teachers continue to push this, and I'm not sure why. I got a little thing I'm going to read here, and I got copies of class stuff they've been handing out pushing this stuff. Uh, as you know, I was here a few months ago. Proud follower of 13, multi-racial, multi-ethnic kid. Lived in a BB district for the past 30 years. Registered nurse. Taking care of thousands of people, all racial groups. Retired Special Forces, Green Beret. Father of four vets, served in five wars. Helped out at Ground Zero after 9-11. Um, most decorated civilian Iraq War. And all this is leading up to something. Uh, started a orphanage in the Philippines. I've helped thousands of kids at least 100, and many unwed mothers have sponsored more translators than many other private individuals. And four of those families actually lived in my home, as Mr. Smith knows. According to my DNA, I'm Jewish, Native American, Ethiopian, and East European descent. Spent hundreds of thousands of my, my money helping out others. But according to, and this is, so I've done all this, you know, on my own dime, but according to Biden, Harris, and Department of Justice Garland, and the school board, is National School Board Association, and some BD teachers are now white supremacists and domestic terrorists for defending my children against anti-racist American school board. Unfortunately, many BD teachers believe it is their duty to teach a racist, divisive, and anti-American, anti-cop agenda. And like I said, I got a couple of the lesson plans here. 
Recently, my son informed me that he got an assignment about a black superhero in English class that was supposedly unjustly shot by a cop and wanted to destroy the human race. At the end of the uh, story, the white girl interviewing him committed suicide because she was so trauma, you know, she couldn't get over her irredeemable white guilt. The teacher then went on and started pushing the lies about hands up, don't shoot, lying about rates of blacks being shot by, you know, by cops. When my son pointed out that she was lying to the students, she told him that she expected the students to go home and fact check her. And it's just not one teacher, it's several that have been doing this stuff. The facts are 60% of all murders committed by blacks, 10 times the percentage of the population, five to 10 times more likely to shoot a cop than a white, but I'm not here to adjudicate that, it's just the teachers who push them on. We've torn our country apart, there's a million law enforcement officers. We've had one incident, and they went on and painted all of the cops as if they're all racist. And everybody in this room knows what I'm talking about. Over the past year, 10,000 blacks have been murdered by Biden, Harris, BLM supporters, and not one by a Trump supporter. I tried to keep politics out, but it was impossible. Because, like I said, I'm now a white supremacist and a domestic terrorist for even talking to you. Everybody shot by cops resisting arrest. A few days later, the, the teacher who was pushing these racist lies got up and to profess for white privilege and white guilt. We've had two BB students kill themselves over the past 18 months. And now the teachers are teaching that's okay because of white guilt and white privilege. I disagree with that. Teachers also give out a black uh, BLM handout and pushing it as a legitimate organization for positive change. And I got a copy of that as well. BLM is a Marxist, Leninist, racist, black nationalist. <coughs> socialist organization that pushes an anti-black family, big government control, authoritarianism, fascism, anti-American divisive agenda. This is not me, you can go on their website and it says all that in a little bit different wording. During the mostly so-called peaceful riots, BLM and Biden-Harris support burned, looted, and vandalized five to 10,000 mostly minority businesses, killed or maimed thousands of blacks, Asians, Jews, and others, including thousands of cops, destroyed many of the inner cities. So the question I have for you guys tonight, I've been coming here for several years now talking, I don't care who the teachers vote for, but I'm sick and tired of them pushing these racist agenda with no pushback because the kids are terrified to stand up to these teachers. And when they're pushing these lies, I, I, my son is very courageous to stand up against this crap. These teachers are pushing lies, it's tearing our nation apart and to say this kid is an oppressor because of his skin color, and my son is oppressed because of his skin color, I totally disagree with that. I have the lesson stuff. So if somebody says, well, this is your imagination. No, it's not. I can show you this stuff. And to push that it's okay to kill yourself because of white guilt. I, I, when I saw that, I, I'm losing my mind. I can't believe that this is allowed to go on. So I don't even know if you guys even know this stuff. I don't know if the teachers wrote it out to you guys before they teach it or what, but I got the lesson plan, so I can show you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, if, if you would uh, give the uh, lesson plans, if you have copies of those to uh, either Mr. Miller or Mr. Baker, um, but I would like to make sure that the administration uh, at the uh, main office has a copy of this, as well as the, the principal, and make sure that something happens about it, because it's not okay either way to teach a conservative agenda or a, a liberal agenda. We're here to teach kids. So. Thank you for your service. <clears throat> um, thank you. <coughs> Ms. Snyder. <coughs> thank you. <coughs> I'm Terry Snyder. I've been in our district for eight years. I have two boys in our middle school and I have one graduate. I care about our community and I care about our school. There's been a lot of chatter lately about some concerning things happening in the middle and high school buildings. I'm going to speak on just one issue, though, that matters the most to me, which is the student restrooms, the behavior and the conduct that's happening inside of them. When I heard of this misconduct, which I'll share some examples shortly, from talking with other parents, ask my children about it. While my middle school boys, thankfully, have not experienced any of these issues in the restroom so far, my daughter that graduated had. In her freshman and sophomore years before transferring to the ACC, she said most of these issues happened regularly and a few more that I hadn't heard of. While I wish she would have brought that to my attention or had mentioned it to the staff at the time, 
she handled it on her own by avoiding the restrooms if she could help it and as much as she could help it. Now, I respect the way she chose to handle it. I do teach my children if they see something to say something, but I also teach them to be problem solvers themselves. And while I respect the way she chose to handle it, it makes me really sad that she felt she had to avoid the restrooms. I don't want any student feeling like they have to avoid those student restrooms to avoid problems. So because she experienced these issues years ago, and there's been such a large amount of conversations and issues coming up with complaints from the community with other parents talking with their children, I felt that it was important that the administration be aware of some of these issues. So I emailed our middle school principal. <coughs> I'd like to read the email so very short, this way the community is aware that when you have a question, you can ask the administration directly, get a response, and those that haven't received a response or are still waiting for one can hear the response now. November 6, Mr. Gallantin, you may have been contacted by other parents in regards to concerns with students in your building with the restrooms. I wanted to pass along my thoughts on this issue. I do not feel this is a gay, trans or furry issue. This is a student body issue. Students in general misbehaving in the bathrooms from smoking, fights, bullying, hanging out, sex acts, urinating and defecating on the floor. While my two children, six and eight, have not experienced these issues, I'm hearing other parents' children are. While I cannot validate this, I thought you should be informed. I wouldn't want any students to be in fear of using the restrooms at school and ask that you look into this. I want the administration to know, in my opinion, this is a widespread issue involving students in the general population, not just one group, but students in general. He replied, <clears throat> thank you for your email. We have not witnessed or identified evidence of these acts. We continue to monitor both administration and staff the restrooms regularly. During the first two weeks of October, I trained all students and staff on harassment, intimidation, bullying, appropriate behavior, use in the restrooms was a specific item that we addressed during this training. Students were given appropriate responses and reporting methods, if any, are inappropriate. Behaviors were taking place. Thanks again. I asked that he forward that on my email also on to um, the high school principal. I thought that was more appropriate for him to do since I don't have a student in the high school currently. Um, Mr. Baker replied, thank you for keeping me in the loop. Matt and Carrie, similar to what Matt stated at the high school, thankfully, we have not seen this specific type of behavior. However, here and there, we do see the decades-old horseplay. With the increased attention on bathrooms, we will revisit our existing bathroom <coughs> monitoring protocols this week that will include limiting the number of students and adults being visible outside of the restrooms. So I appreciated the quick response back. It was less than two hours and it was on a Saturday at that. While I do trust our school administrators and our teachers and our staff, and that response back somewhat put me at ease, I'm also realistic to know that they can't only be in so many places at once. So I think that it is possible that these misbehaviors can arise, whether that be regularly or infrequent and go unnoticed. I don't want any of our children to feel unsafe to use their school restroom. If the school is in need of extra support from parent volunteers to help out with this issue or potential issue, I'm willing. So please share that with others as well. Lastly, I'd like to make a plea that us adults be careful about using labels when talking about our district students. When we were in school, we got labeled. Others got labeled. It happens. I realize this may never go away. But we are adults now. We're not kids anymore. We know better and we can do better. It's not the gay kids, the trans kids, the furry kids, the popular kids, the mean girls, the jocks, the nerds, the drama club kids, the goth kids, the class clowns, the band geeks. It's not any of that. It's just kids. Our kids. Our students. Thank you. Thank you very much. I was going to speak on this issue next month, the same as her. I'm, I have a lot of kids in the school system and uh, relatives, nieces, nephews, I mean, a bunch. And they're telling me exactly the same as we're, and one of the problems was they had a resource officer that was female. Now we're talking specifically with boys bring them out, that they would have a lot of these same issues that she has. I, I was going to say this next month, but I'm just confirming, I'm hearing the exact same story she is. 
Um, the district update, we have been through the one through 22 and through 23. I'm going to go ahead and have Brian Baker come first and we'll do the DEHS update. Okay. All right. So, my notes on my phone here. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, let's see here. So um, every month we do students of the month at the high school and uh, I'm going to read all their names. Uh, so everybody can uh, hear our students of the month. Uh, we have uh, Blake Smith, who's a sophomore, Robert Ross, who's a freshman, Jacob Eliason, who's a freshman, Carson Voss, who's a senior, Audrey Hansen, who's a senior, Elizabeth Finley, who's a freshman, Kenzie Elkire, who's a sophomore, Nathan Kierzen, who's a freshman, Laura Church, who's a freshman, uh, Lila Hall, who's a junior, Brian Hughes, who's a freshman, Brianna Pfeiffer, uh, Pfeiffer, who's a junior, Madison Upchurch, who's a sophomore, Gwen Klinger, who's a freshman, Chloe Phantom, who's a junior, and our staff member was Mr. Ruffin, one of our new teachers. So, um, yeah, let's give a round of applause for our students. So, joining me tonight are a few of those uh, students uh, that were able to come tonight. So, uh, once you all come back up, we want the same ones who did the pledge. A little something about them. So I'm the oldest. My kids couldn't put me in the mood when I was in school. Yeah. <laughs> so Audrey over here. Audrey, uh, we'll read a description here. So Audrey has been leading our school announcements this past month. Uh, her energy and confidence are inspirational for students to start their day right. Um, so she was nominated by a staff member, so let's give her a round of applause. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. Okay, Brian. So it says, I have seen tremendous growth in Brian as, re as a result of his positive attitude and initiative. Keep up the great work, Brian. You have a bright future ahead. And he was nominated by Mrs. Pierce. Finally, have Carson on here. So, uh, Carson has also been a leader of our announcements each month, and uh, his um, his positive and uplifting voice are inspirational for students to start their day right. Also, nominated, nominated by a staff member. Give a round of applause for Carson. <laughs> We're very proud of all of our students of the month, uh, especially for these students here that were able to join us and with their families uh, as well. So, thank you very much. Uh, the high school, um, I guess the, the part of the highlight for today, um, we were lucky enough to be able to be the highlight of the high school. So um, we are excited for um, so much happening. Like uh, today, actually, we were a part of the Veterans Parade. That's why I have my tie on today, as you can see. So again, um, we want to thank all our veterans for their service. It was very positive. The high school has not been able to be a part of that in the past because they've done it in the middle of the gym. Um, they were kind enough to invite us, and we were able to collaborate and have a nice parade out there uh, today. So that was that was great. Uh, we're also getting ready for our um, Thanksgiving break. So I know the students are ready uh, for a little bit of a breather, and so are the staff. We're just thankful to be back five days a week. I think it's been a true blessing, a true Thanksgiving blessing for all of us to have kids back. We, we aren't out of the woods yet. We are still certainly dealing with COVID, uh, but we are managing it better than I think we ever had, have in the past, and so we're super proud of that. Um, so, um, high school is a great place to be, and I'm very thankful to be able to serve as the principal and have students like you. Thank you. All right, thanks a lot. Um, I was gonna have next year, me, Dr. Nicole will come up about the uh, Like Dr. Miller's kids, I was never the uh, um, student of the month either. So, um, <laughs> and I know my COVID update is really exciting, but uh, you, you high school students are not going to pin me if you guys want to head on home and accept your evening a little sooner. So, so please, uh, congratulations. Uh, this is our 
my uh, COVID update for the, the month. So again, our goal for the year is to get kids in school. Um, we were at a super, county superintendent's meeting a couple weeks back and got some, some good data from Meta that our, the students that were in school more had less loss of their, their PI. So it was nice that we uh, were in school, so our, uh, our students lost the least um, when you compare them to the other schools that were um, in hybrid longer and, and going virtual. So it was good that we got our kids in, into school. Um, having said that, right now we're at about 11 cases as of today, um, and it's distributed pretty evenly amongst the buildings. So the high school, middle school, and west all have three um, confirmed positive cases right now, and we have two at east. Um, no staff members at this time. Um, we, at our quarantines are um, at 27. If you look back to the same time last year, we were at 110 quarantines, and, and we were at a, a week-long uh, Thanksgiving break just to, to get our quarantines back. But with the mask uh, stay and the uh, test to play, we're only at 27 students right now out of, out of school due to the quarantine. But that's not monthly. It could go into all the school for a week. We did. Right. So we're in much better shape than we, we were this time last year in terms of the, the quarantine. So we are able to, to keep our kids in school. Um, this is the, the dashboard that I keep on, on my records. This is not with the uh, Bill or Public Health, but this is what I use to submit my um, data to them. And this is pretty much the same thing that you saw on the other slide, um, except this does include our um, the essential student exemptions, which are mass and stay. So those students that, we have 39 students that are in school, mass, able to um, quarantine in class and, and not miss uh, any school. We do have one pending. Um, case right now that we at the high school, I believe. So if that was confirmed, that would increase our um, high school. But again, numbers look pretty good. We did have a perceived spike um, the last two weeks, but it did it subsided. So um, myself and the health department, we kind of concluded that it was trick or treat. That seemed to be about that time. The county itself had a, a spike that seemed to be um, of similar length. So they're they're going down. But I did get some questions um, over the past couple weeks of who's tracking this data, how do we know if it's school spread, how do we know, um, or, or who knows what's going on here. So um, I was just going to go through what we're doing with, uh, with the COVID data. So parents required to call the school attendance office. So your students, know many students, they call their building. They report that positive case to myself and the nurse. We report that to the health department. <coughs> the health department confirms those cases. Once those cases are confirmed, we identify the close contacts in the school. Now, the principals behind the scenes are, are identifying those folks already so that once we do get a, a verification that we can go ahead and contact those parents. Um, and then I track that uh, this spreadsheet here, there's a, a whole bunch of data that goes in to populate those cells. I track all that. So I have all the verified and unverified cases and quarantines for the entire district for the last two years that I track. And that's how I was able to, uh, I know we sent a letter out last week regarding um, our, our situation at West. And I got a, a couple questions about what is school spread. For me, school spread is if I'm positive, I come in and Mr. Osborne is a close contact, so he is quarantined as a close contact, and then he later develops COVID. That would be um, what the health department and I would consider school spread. We had three cases um, in schools from that. What we're seeing is I'm positive and Justin happens to be positive. There's not that intermediate um, correlation. The health department has not been able to find a correlation as well. So um, I don't know what the call that spike was. Let's go back down to normal. It seems so, to so Justin was not positive because you gave us some. We can't we can't make that that tie because there was no uh, he was not a case contact first, or I was not a case contact. So we're not able to say it, it, it is <coughs> spread. But having said all that, we're in a good place right now. Um, and, and heading into the holidays, hopefully, we stay that way. Um, again, we all. Yeah, go ahead. So, the time, you thought you were confirmed through it with my son. Yep. So, the time you said the school confirms, and then you have to wait to hear from the health department before you notify know, others. How long is that normally? Because I got a letter from the health department after he returns to school. You'll so, hear from the school before you hear from the health department. Yeah, okay. Um, and that's by design for them because they're so um, yeah. understaffed that they have that and the middle school is exceptional about um, getting that communication out there. So I'm sure you yeah, have that as are our other buildings. 
but for actual confirmation, it's about three three days. Right now, they got it to come pretty quick, so they put all their staff on the on the school so that they can turn over that the, the school information. So right so now, we're over the day. We can't notify the school until we get that confirmation. That's correct because we have had cases that were not verified, so um, we had to back off on on that. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Can I, can I also, I, just to get it in my head about what you're saying with the um, non-school trip. Okay. So if we have close contact at school, that kid has quarantine. Obviously, if they're vaccinated, they can come with a mask. And as long as they're not symptomatic, right? But we're not seeing those kids develop COVID. We are not. Uh, okay. We're not seeing a kid go from case contact to case. Now we have seen kids that that's quarantine at home is not not um, testing positive either at a later point. We're not seeing that. Okay. We've seen okay. three cases of that in, in two years. Okay. Um, but we are seeing if I test positive and my, my sister will later test positive. We're seeing a lot of the, the household cases on the <coughs> case contact rankings. Well, and if that's verifiable in a different category, right? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, I heard from a couple parents that had positive cases that they never they never or are just now having the health department contact them to do any kind of root cause so we really don't know they're saying we don't know that it wasn't spread at school or on the bus or do you know does the health department even have a lead time for the health department does their questionnaire but we do the same questionnaire that the health department does. So any school case, we've already asked those questions that the health department will ask. So we have the same data that the health department's going to get. We have it seven to 10 days earlier. Um, because our nurse has to get a, a, an answer where the health department does. If they try three times, if they can't get hold of anybody, they move on and they actually call it unable to, to confirm and it, it's safe and it's um, so we get that our nurse, our district nurse calls and questions all of them. We have that questionnaire that, that they go through. So we do have that that data sometimes even though it's part of the testing. Is there a way that can you use that to react quickly? Yes. You can use the nurse's data if the health department is. <clears throat> we can't. We got burnt early uh, on sending kids home on quarantine, so we are not allowed to issue quarantine. We're allowed to exclude sick kids. We are not allowed to exclude healthy kids. No. So I have to wait. We've decided, well, I've decided to wait until the health department verifies the case, so I'm not excluding healthy kids, so that it's the, the health department that's doing the quarantine. No. So I mean, there, there could be a, a lag. So. Is there any, you get the data on a daily basis so that if there is a spread that if we have to add another preventative measure or increase cleaning or something. This spreadsheet that. that I have that you guys <coughs> that filled this would show me those trends and that's what I follow. We kind of watch. Um, with the spike at West, it was um, three kids in the fourth grade, three kids in the, the second grade, three kids, and it was spread amongst the homerooms, amongst the grade levels. Well, the the bus. A common bus. There was no commonality. Um, to why it was happening the way it was happening. That's what's very frustrating for us. Any other questions for me? The fact that there's no commonality leads you to believe that there's probably not spreading in school. It's basically. I can't say that it is spreading. I, I can't say that it's not. You can't spreading. say that it is. You can't say that it isn't. That's what I mean. If there's no commonality, they're not in the same class, they're not in the same classroom. It makes it tough. It may have a kid. Oh, if it walks like a duck, talks like a duck, it's probably a duck. I think a lot of them are in the same classrooms, but you just can't tell who gave it to a lot. Like, they might on hand as friends all have it. They sit together at lunch, but they also play football together. So clearly, they gave it to each other. One, but where was where it? Where was it? We don't know. And I think that that's probably the case with some other families as well. The magic virus. The numbers are at the county level. The county members are, or the health department for the state, like that always are, are the lowest in the county. They, ours are the lowest in the county. The but county no, I meant our community. They are, yes. They're sneaking up. The and county they numbers also lag uh, our numbers. They're not as responsible. So we get the county numbers after you open the line. All right. Brian, close.
see it's a good evening and happy All Those Things doing. So this is the time of year that we uh, start to have some new data about our students, um, specifically in relation to last year's uh, academic performance. So I just wanted to share some of the dates with you. So first of all, where are Bay Valley students going after they graduate? So our last year's uh, seniors, 29% entered the workforce, 5% in the military, and 66% went to a two or four year college. I will say that this year we're working with the school counselors in the high school. We're gonna have all the students take the ASVAB test, which might help increase students who might be interested in military service. So that's something we're looking to uh, start this year. This is last year, yep. So this, just so you know, for the state, the uh, average school district spends 12692 per pupil, and we are 12007 So just keep that in mind as we go through the data. I think we'll see that we're getting some good value for our money here. Okay. Now our number there includes the transportation, which is really expensive. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of us are interact, absolutely. So in the state of Ohio last year, the average performance index was 72.5. The performance index is a, it's a formulation the state goes through. So when a student takes the Ohio um, state test, depending on what level they are rated, so accelerated, advanced, whatever, there's a certain weight given to that, and they come up with this number. So the state average was 72.5 last year. Here at Buckeye Valley, we were 84.1. I'll note that's a dip, uh, but for the state, the average school district, sorry, in, in the central Ohio, the average district dropped um, at least 12 points in online learning. Um, you would expect that, that most districts would have a bit of a hit, but as Jeremy had indicated, um, I think with our hybrid model, means we, were, we did not experience as significant of a, of a drop in some districts. Some in central Ohio that we look to, I won't name names, but they dropped 20 or more points, so I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Prepared for success, this is an area where the state has a whole bunch of factors that, you know, are, do our students leave the district prepared for college workforce to be productive citizens in life? Uh, and, and there are several factors that go into that. For the state, the average last year was 41.2. We were 60.1, and that was, we were in the top 16% of the state. So that was an awesome job for us in this area. For this one, for our honors diploma, 31.6% <coughs> of our kids graduated with an honors diploma, which is the top 12 in the state. Next, we were the top 18%. That was for students who took the AP exam, had a score of three or more for their points was 19 kids. College credit plus. So we have 42.4% of our kids have 12 CCP credits or more when they graduate. This is a huge financial gain for our parents who have kids. This means that they left our doors with several college credits under their belt that were um, paid for. So this is a good <coughs> thing for college and college opportunities. We are working, I will note, we're working to strengthen this even more with um, Columbus State. We're strengthening a collaboration with them to offer more courses next year through Columbus State. Ryan, is yeah. all the credits essentially a semester? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And the goal is with our Columbus State, um, I don't want to say partnership, but agreement that we're going to have with them, we'll be able to offer, what we did is we looked at what are courses that a lot of our kids are leaving to take, and we're going to start having more of those in house, so our kids can still come to Buckeye Valley High School, remain in the community. The Buckeye Valley High School teachers will be teaching their courses as instructors or facilitators. That will be an exciting thing to watch. The four-year graduation rate in the state is 93 percent. That means that the student graduate on time after being in high school for four years. Buckeye Valley, we're 96.9. So other similar districts to us around the state are 87.2. So another um, great success. 
That's for sure for that. There are 13 growth areas that were measured on each year, and this year, 11 of the 13, we were at expected or above growth. Some target areas, though, I do want to point out one thing we continue to work on is closing our achievement gap. So with our students with disabilities and students that are to reduce meals, there are measures in place that look to see if there are a significant gap between general education students and um, students in those subgroups. That's an area that we still are striving uh, to make gains with. And I would say that the pandemic had some larger impacts on some of those kiddos. Um, if they're on free and reduced meals, there can be a correlation to perhaps they don't have great technology or internet connection at home, so things like that. We definitely want in the next few years to target in on those kids to have um, help close that gap. And those are the main updates. Any questions? Are we coming up on It is. Okay, but I can see the great bang for your buck. <laughs> Good for your money. I have one question. And yeah. I don't know if you can answer it, but I'll you showed it. the percentage of students on the very first slide that go to college or workforce. Yes. Um, did that? Do you know if that changed dramatically over the last couple of years? Because it used to be, I think it was like almost 80% went to college. So it's that's been as high as the right. 70s. Um, for two most of college and as high as the nine percent. Yes. From the and I will all from year to year when you have 180 kids as well. And I'm in a I'm in a cohort of people in Central Ohio, similar districts to mine, um, who are physicians. That's somewhat a trend we saw, and we do think that again, um, for some families with the uncertainties of what was going on with with COVID and other things, that some people may have chosen to take a gap year um, instead and sort of see how things went. So it was a similar trend that we. We call it a go around the country. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 College enrollment yeah. 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 across the entire country is yeah. down yeah. right now. Yeah. 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 Well, and, and I will say, say COVID, I don't yeah, and I do think that people are more like with the economy right now. You know, college isn't always the answer. We want kids to be prepared, if that is. But a lot of for those probably also saw some great opportunities um, to go ahead and leave high school and work for a little bit, maybe gain us some money while wages um, pretty high for some jobs. So I think all those things went into play. But when you look at our numbers, our kids definitely had the experiences behind them that they had wanted to go ahead with it. Yeah, the skill trade has definitely been in deficit for the last several years. So we're, yeah. we're hiring like crazy and we can't, we can't find people. I mean, it's impossible. And hopefully, like the, the Delaware Area Career Center next year is going to start having like a second shift school because some of their programs are in high demand. And hopefully, that'll help us get more of our kiddos uh, who are interested in uh, career tech over into their programs without such a wait list. So that's exciting. As you, in my strategic plan to prepare people for the workforce. Yes. Well, you are pivoting a little bit at the high school in our offerings to prepare kids for not just college but for the workforce as well. Absolutely. That's why I was asking yeah. to find out if we're preparing for either path. Yeah, and I know, I know we talked a little bit at the last meeting. But when we're looking at like the program to replace Aviance, yes. it also um, will have a component um, pre well, kindergarten through 12th grade, but it'll help build their what's a good career for you, what are your interests, and it'll help track that through time. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. How will we measure up against the school districts in the county and in the uh, central South area? So we did well. I want to say in Central Ohio, like our performance oh, index, yeah. we were I think the 12th, and that includes all of Franklin County, Delaware County, because it is actually 23 districts yeah. above the yeah. yeah. We were in the top. We were above average in all areas. 
um, to our counterparts. Where will they build that or, 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 or the decrease in income and that of the top schools? And we said earlier, what's the interesting place the school districts that needs to be in session will have us decrease? That's a big Any other questions? Thank you, everyone. Thank you, all right. Thank you, Brian. I got up on slide. Right. And that's it for the district update. Well, it's not like uh, we're doing well, uh, really. Yeah, I think they may address like they do colonies. Well, they did that. He was news a little before Best Boss. Um, they did pretty well. I feel like we're in the for the next year. She's going to be the result of For sure. I will, I will say that next month we'll have one more announcement we can make about West but they're being told as a surprise tomorrow morning. And if I would announce it right now, there's some moles in the room that would help spread the word over the surprise. So. Well, so you can't, you can't do ourselves. You know, we don't want that broadcast, but it'll be a surprise to them. It's fantastic. Okay. Uh, moving on. We are at the financial items. I need a motion for 4.1, please. I move that the Buckeye Valley Board of Education approve the attached financial report and recommendation of the Second. And so. Okay. I'm okay. Um, I'll do the board. I'm a high five report, yes. Well, this is the five year forecast. Oh, no, darn it. Oh, man. You're too excited. Oh, first. You're yeah. Right. Okay. This is like 16 to five year forecast. Right. <laughs> oh, God. I'm really, I'm so excited about this. All right, now, it's routine financial, zero to zero, like good. Anything to report? Any questions from the board? There are no questions about this month end, then I need a little Okay, now for the moment you've all been waiting for, I need a motion for 4.2, please. I'm excited. I kind of jumped by agenda. I don't. I'm excited um, that you're excited to be here. <laughs> I must say this is quite the uh, quite the um, well-rounded board meeting. We got COVID updates, we got academic updates, and now we're finalizing with financial updates. So he's the most buzz head in a room. Right by the forecast, which I know you're not here for me, but I'm gonna tell myself that. So. <laughs> so. Everyone likes numbers like I do. Um, if you're going to walk out, make sure you're I was going to say, you know. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, don't tell them. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. So, um, so just a kind of background. Um, as a school district, um, the higher Department of Education requires that districts conform a five-year forecast twice a year, um, by November 30th and May 30th. So, again, this will be under my November. The fiscal year is going five years out. Um, our year end is always June 30th. So, uh, oh wait, I have to go back. Sorry, what's that? Um, so, there's numerous items um, that we report about revenue expenditures. What I do is I have a huge, I have a lovely Excel spreadsheet. I have an 18 page note of why the numbers are they are. Um, if anyone calls me, I will probably have them on the phone for about an hour, two hours, explaining it to you. So, if you're that bored and or entertained by me, give me a call. <laughs> so, what I try to do for the board is that, um, again, it's not first time they've heard this, is that I try to do, um, I've learned that graphs are the way to go. Thank you, this is us. Um, and then I try to just keep it real to the point, basic, and then again, if you have questions, um, you go through it. So the first one is general fund revenue, expenditures, and cash balance. As you can see, what they do is I do three years prior and then five years going forward. 
Um, again, these graphs, how many revenues are going up, expenditures are going up, and obviously expenditures are going up, revenues are going up, but it's but expenditures are going more than revenue, obviously our cash balance will decrease. Um, so that's just a visual of what's going on. Our expenditures are increasing at a faster rate than revenues, and we will start de deficit spending by fiscal year 2023. Um, ending cash balance, um, the rule of thumb is that everyone, they always want you to have a 60-day cash <coughs> balance, just so, just depending on how revenues come in, whether it's from the state, um, the county, the federal government, just to make sure you have enough money to cover your bills. Um, so they always ask for a 60-day cash balance. So I always have 60-day cash on hand at all times. As you can see, we um, we surpass that um, in a very healthy way. This is the, our general fund revenue source. Um, almost 80% of our revenue comes from the local the local taxpayers, um, which is, is huge. Um, again, our, our real estate tax is 45%, and we have over a, we have pretty much 100% collection rate, which shows that the, the taxpayers. You're, I can't do my job unless the taxpayers do the, their job, and so therefore. Um, you guys are paying and on time, so I, I really appreciate that. Um, and then um, the income tax is obviously a local source too, and that's almost 28%. So, um, and then 20% 20, 20 comes from the state of Ohio. So as you can see, between, this, between the local and the income tax, almost more than the majority of our revenue is coming from the local taxpayers. Um, this is Again, showing local versus state. Local revenue is increasing as the district is at the 20 mill floor. Um, House Bill 110 includes open enrollment within the basic eight. So the new funding formula that came out comes out every two years on the odd year of the governor's budget, which that's not following all of that. Um, and so they actually, a new budget went into effect July 1st, 2021. They actually have not told the school how they're really gonna be funded yet. Um, they're still working it out. So I will know more information come December. Um, notes about the, our operating revenue, um, training annual budget was 2020. Um, and, there, and again, our class one, which is our residential, is our taxpayers, homeowners, um, our property value went up 10.43%, which I'm sure I'm telling the people who pay the bills, so you guys would aware that it went up 10%. Um, However, in Buckeye Valley's case, that since we had the 20 mill floor, we actually received all the additional funds, which is great for the district. Um, our income tax, first half of the fiscal year 22, had increases that was more in line with the previous years before the pandemic. When the pandemic hit, we didn't really know if people were working or if they were working from home. Um, and so we were very cautious on how we were going to direct it going forward, just to ensure that um, we knew if the economy was still stable. Also, a hard thing was with the federal government pushing back when your your tax um, taxes were due. It threw off the cycles of people were paying. So we just wanted to follow it closely to make sure that it wasn't a trend or a concern. It was just the timing. Um, like I said, House Bill 110 is a fair funding plan. Made changes to state funding payments and expenses. So prior to this, is that if I had a student coming open and rolling, so if they live not in Buckeye Valley, they came to Buckeye Valley schools, I would show the revenue on top. Same as if I had a kid that went to Buckeye Valley and went to a different school just to address all the expenses coming out. Now they took that completely out of my funding formula and they're paying it directly to the school that the child is going to. So it looks like there's a huge loss of revenue and loss of expenses on my five year forecast cover, not necessarily the case, they're just taking it and direct paying those schools instead of having it flow through my funding formula. Um, again, as I said, the state is, is delayed in giving us the actual numbers. Um, again, so for forecasting, we do a very similar to what we had prior to. Um, and then um, student wealth, wellness and success funds in the last budget was a special fund, and now they just rolled it into my basic state aid. So that's revenue. Is there any revenue questions? Okay. Are you anticipating that we'll be at the 20 mil floor throughout this five year forecast? Correct. Okay. Correct. Yes. Um, expenditures, um, as you can see, wages is 56% of wages and benefits, which is a package 
is 77 percent. Um, the state average for different for all the schools is about 75 percent, so we're a little higher than the average state eight like, expenses. Um, um, and then services that include tuition and utilities is the next largest area of the forecast. So as you can see, like the revenues, expenditures, and then services. Services is anything that we can we cannot provide in house, whether it's services for students, whether it's um, fixing something, whether it's it's anything that we cannot do with our current staff, we purchase that source. So therefore, it's in the service category. So it's after we legal go to insurance. legal insurance. Yes. Yeah. Long way. Long way. Long way. All of our, our um, care professionals are technically called a personal service. Um, they are employed through the ESC and they are assigned to Buckeye Valley. So that's going to be in our service bucket. Um, general fund expenditures by object code. Again, everything has an object code. Um, our costs continue to rise, and again, salaries and benefits are growing. Um, are, are growing in the forecast. Um, between last fiscal year and this fiscal year, we added 11 um, FTEs, which FTEs is a full-time equivalence. Um, of those 11, four of them were done um, because of the growth in numbers. For example, an extra kindergarten class, an extra um, third, like third grade class, an extra second grade class. We did, however, added seven staff members to improve the programming at Buckeye Valley. Um, and those are being used various ways throughout the district that align with the strategic plan. And then the, day, the days of true cash, again, they recommend 60 days. Um, items to consider about our finances going forward. Um, income tax is showing a positive turnaround from the pandemic. Um, prior to the pandemic, we were getting four or 5% every single year, which is fabulous. It means the economy and the local um, tax base is growing. Real estate values are continuing to grow. Um, the new state funding, <coughs> the new state budget is not giving us new money, um, at least what I projected, projected was right now. Again, I'll know more information in December when that comes out. Um, ESSER's funds may help to reduce general fund costs in fiscal year 21 to 24 um, to, have, to help offset the pandemic expenses. Um, those are not on this forecast. Um, those are special pots of uh, funds. Um, and the district is using those for various projects throughout the district. Um, it is also, ESSER's money was a, a one-time influx of money. So if, if the district plans to um, keep those programs for um, those personnel, they would have, their own fund would have to um, absorb those costs because um, there's no continuous ESSER. Um, future funding is uncertain still for fiscal years 24 to 26 because again they're trying really hard to change the funding formula at the district at the state level they make strides um, not as much as they would hope but hoping that going forward it gets even better um, again as like always we need to continue monitoring our expenses as we get as we begin to deficit spend um, another big thing on here that we do for expense wise is our health insurance. Um, we are part of the consortium for health insurance and they do, if the consortium has a good year, they will um, give the district premium holidays. I mean, if two, last year, for example, we had two premium holidays. Um, and it's over $600,000 savings to the district. Um, so I don't project those going forward because we're not a guarantee. I, we, I won't find out if we get those until May or June of that year. Um, and luckily our health insurance increases have been under 5% for the past five years, um, depending on how the consortium does. So um, those are two big items that we just we can monitor closely and just evaluate, um, it's like every month I <laughs> reevaluate, um, just to ensure that we are getting the best um, for, for any, <coughs> any questions with expenses. Could you elaborate on the Positions that we're adding that alone. I mean, we're we're spending more money by design. Correct. We are absolutely. Um, we added a gifted coordinator this year, full-time gifted coordinator. We added a eighth and ninth grade school counselor, which Natalie did not have before. We added um, two two um, professional coaches. That's two, four. 
we added. Sorry. No, you're fine. Um, intervention specialist. And we added two, uh, one and a half online teachers. High school. Uh, they would be both, don't they? Open to both? Yes. And the guidance counselor at the high school, too. 89. Yeah, so they kind of are the bridge between those one and school. Okay, so. Oh, sure. Brian, you can go ahead. Yeah, so this year we have one. Curriculum instruction and assessment specialist in each building, so they work under my department. Uh, so there's one housed at East West Middle School and High School. They help coach teachers in best practices, help model lessons for them, but they also help, you know, if we adopt, let's say, a new reading series or mathematics series, they help the teachers with implementing that successfully. Um, and they also help with like uh, teachers understanding assessment data. You know, here your kids took this test, like the end of the EA, when our kids take that, what can you do with that data? How can you provide interventions? How can you provide gifted support to them? So that type of role. So previously, the district had two split between the elementary schools and the middle and high school. And it's just really hard to form that relationship and connection uh, with them for that. So this will be an effective thing for our block. And I think the principals and teachers have been happy with this increased service. So if you look at all the five year forecasts fitted, again, be able to get like the numbers there yet. Every school district has done this since about 82 years. Okay. Um, just because you don't know the state of the um, you're going through the third triennial budget with the county. Um, the only funds, that, again, that I, I know of are my negotiated agreements that I have secured for three years. Um, and again, an idea of that fund, some of those. Um, so, five, projecting five years are is kind of hard. Um, there's so many unknowns. So you kind of do the best you can with what you have. Um, ideally, like anything after two years is kind of, un I don't say uncertain, but I just want to rely on it once you decide with what's in the first two years. When you look at earned debt, revenue caught low, and spent the caught. Correct. And we're still in black, talking as well. Correct. So we're still in the black five years out. So then five years, we still. With our fund balance is still up line. So this is my 16th budget forecast, and I think two years out every time I do that, that's what I'm saying. Correct. And we have yeah. that deficit spread again. Right. So um, that's a testament to um, it's a double edged sword, right? You're being very conservative on, on the estimates for the revenues and and you know, a little bit liberal on the expenditures so that we don't run out of money. You're doing a good job. We're doing a good job. Yeah. That's, and, that's, that's the point. And back to one of the big ones is the premium policy. Mm -hmm. Because we can't count on it. Right. Right. But when we don't have to spend that money, it's like somebody's just giving <coughs> right. you know, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. a big, a big deal. It's a big deal. Can I ask one more question? Sure. Because I think I just typed in some sleight of hand in there that I didn't catch before. This is the first time I've heard about it. So the state is actually paying students who are in this district, but not going to school here directly, instead of giving it to us. And then Sorry, I'm not giving it to them. It's giving to the school they're attending. Yeah, it, it's sending it straight straight to the school so instead of sending it to us and then taking it away from us. So this Correct. Is, so, so, so now when we report that a child is going, is a Buckeye Valley, was in Buckeye Valley, but now is attending, Big Walnut, just, just throw it out there, or Delaware City, is that before I would show the revenue coming in, and then I would show the expense going out on my five-year forecast, and so would they. So now they're just they're wiping it all out, and so once our EMIS person puts in the, puts in the computer system that 
Joe Smith is going to Delaware, that money funneled right to Delaware. Okay. So is that also true for homeschool online? So homeschool, so homeschool, there's no funding. There's no state funding with a homeschool child. So if you're homes, if you're a homeschool child, your parents are or whoever you're living with are paying the property taxes and that's still coming to Buckeye Valley, but there's no state money associated with the homeschool child because they're technically not enrolled in any Buckeye Valley school. Correct. It, it, it doesn't. Unless, there is no money for that child. But now, but kids enrolled in Buckeye Valley, so he's enrolled in Buckeye Valley. But we, our computer is pointing him to Delaware City. That money is funneled with it to that child. So, which is more likely the case: the kid from Delaware that enrolls in Buckeye Valley, yeah. that money comes to Buckeye right. Valley. Right. So the thing about it is, you didn't mean the future Buckeye implication Valley. for me is that. He's enrolled in some kind of public education. It might not be ours, but right. it's a public education. If they were here, we would get the money. Right. But we're no longer seeing it. Which Correct. means, so which means that children. it's automatically going someplace else. Right. So it never looks like it's being taken away from us, but it is. Ideally, yes. <laughs> Correct. Correct. Because the idea is all you ever want, districts always, when you have open enrollment in and out, you always want to hope that you're getting more open enrollment than you are getting out. Because that way, then you're, I mean, you're right. essentially making money. Um, you're really not. But it's your, it's, you're in the black. You're, more kids are coming in than are going out. But in this case, they're taking your in and your out, and they're taking completely away from you and just saying, we'll deal with that at the state level. Well, you're getting the state money, but you're not getting property taxes on those kids coming in. For the open enrollment. Oh, yeah. Correct. Right. Correct. I'm getting their state money. You're getting so state money, but, you, but what you just showed, right. though, is that most of our funding comes mm -hmm. from our property taxes practice. and right. our income right. taxes. Correct. So the state money is really negligible right. uh, to a point. So if we have, we have to be careful um, bringing more open enrollment kids in yes. that would increase the number of staff that we would need to have. Correct. Because that creates more expenditure right. than <coughs> getting that additional those additional funds for from the property taxes or the income taxes of that shop. Well, getting the state level. So Mr. Right. Horner said that you know we spent about twelve thousand seven hundred and two dollars on it or twelve thousand seven. Twelve thousand seven. Well, if you put <coughs> enrollment into Buckeye Valley, you only bring it in six thousand right. dollars. So right then and there, I'm six thousand seven. Correct. Correct. So it's just monitoring the whole, yeah. adding staff. Or so along those lines, we don't hope that we'll that staff at all. Correct. So right. No, and, and I know we're that's where we're at. So it's yeah. um, the, the only the only place where that doesn't apply is you know if it's by contract for a teacher that lives outside the district Correct. or works in the district. Correct. Correct. There, you know, which I think that's pretty standard for every district. Correct. I didn't even start that. I was just trying no, to. No, I think you were just trying to. No, no, I get it. But I didn't even think it correctly. I mean, <laughs> when it, and then it follows the child exactly where they're going. There's, it, I'm no longer the funnel of it. Yeah, it's it's a, it's, it's good for the, those in the audience that, that want to and need to understand that. And so. so we've been not deficit spending for a decade or so that I've been here. Correct. This is my ninth school year. Yeah. So, the ninth year. Okay. so we have maybe one year in that nine years have we spent on these products. So our fund balance has gone up. I think like for my neighbor that wants, you know, why don't you live within your means? I think for the public that doesn't understand our financial situation and how high our fund balance is, we're living within our means. We're living within our means and we're spending more on exactly what the strategic plan said, excellent teachers, mm -hmm. career preparation, mm -hmm. online. There was one other thing that was expanded offerings. How is our staff hiring matching expanded off offerings, like at the high school? Yeah, so I do the instructional coaches. <coughs> Yeah, and we're continuing, like we are working with the high school and middle school now to start planning what our course offerings are for, for next year. 
so we can again continue to expand what offerings we have for our students. Um, and even some partnerships like I, I was speaking with with Columbus State or something can help expand those. I thank you. I think that um, the dang, danger or the worry is like the only way to. I mean, we still worry about the 60 day minimum balance, even at the worst case five years. Correct. Correct. So, in the future, five, ten years from now, the only way to change that would be to rip or to lose Perfect. staff through attrition. So, it's something that could be planned over. As you can see, staff are a big expense. So, yeah. in order to, if you want to switch it, staff, staff making benefits is the biggest. Yeah, I'm just wondering about the city union or anything. Or if it's like we need to increase the income tax. We're so far away from thinking about that. But we don't need that right now. We, no, have to no, we don't need it. Uh, there's plenty of options. There, there's a lot of options. It, it just depends on if you want to reduce the, the programming, you know, that's in the future. Uh, and provide the kids with fewer options or maintain and or increase the programming, then you have to increase the, the income in some way, shape, or form, or reduce the expense. So, uh, the other you know, big per pupil cost that we have in our district is budget uh, compared to other districts. That's a state law, so we're around that. <laughs> Stuff. I mean, so it really kind of tied your hands on how many ways that you can nice. generate revenue or reduce your funding. I think the decisions that you've made on where you're spending your money match the values of the community that matches the teacher's plan. Excellent teachers, more support, more career choice, more. Thank you, but it's just a little scary moving forward. Mm -hmm. How do we manage the deficit funding? Believe me, I know. That's what you're going to learn. I freak out every time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I freak every time. Yeah. Well, yeah. Oh, yeah. Every time. <laughs> yeah. They bring together the, the what they want. I yeah. have a little harder task, and then we get there. <laughs> yeah. You know, I so miss. I'm going to miss those. That's yeah. no, okay. That's okay. Yeah, yeah. Not really. Start a relationship. How does it succeed? We're still out in Tennessee. Well, yeah, but the, the, heart, the heart attacks happen behind closed doors, behind the board. And then the board groups that have them on the website. They're probably great for supporting like what the money is and adding things. Um, and if there are all of these things, for you know, about what happens to us, if you know, if it's not. Just to pull up and where why they want that and how it's going to work. You should tell me on Friday afternoon and then I calm down over the weekend and we come back Monday and have like an educated conversation. Where do you show the investment revenues that you so The general fund is just, it's just um, in other revenues. Other revenues. Yeah. 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 And you have, you have both the, because there was two capital expenditures that we made that were paying on the general Correct. fund. Correct. Middle Street VC and main campus. So that's like right. maybe six, seven hundred thousand yep. a year, and that will 50, drop off. Six fifty four, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that will drop off at some point. Correct. I mean, obviously, middle school is three or four more years ahead of high school average. But yeah, we already made a we already made the first payment for that, and even though it wasn't done, we started paying up. So that would be a nice short term. Correct. Asking, so you tell them they can't afford it. So, I don't think they can't afford it. I don't know. Is it need or want? And then after that, we scan the body. Because usually everyone says Jack, and they're like, oh, I mean, I guess it's like, it's like want. And I said, well, then let's go back and talk about it. <laughs> I would, um, I don't know if you guys, before you put it online, just to kind of like, to give 
that big picture paragraph, we are on purpose planning deficit spending to improve our performance as planned. I don't know that we're planning deficit spending. But. Well, we're, we're investing. More we're investing. 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 PowerPoint Google issue, but we'll fix it before I put it up there. I'll make sure that it's on my Google. It's really good. It's accurate for two or three years. It is. It's and accurate. It does. You it's are accurate. showing that we're going to be spending a little bit more than we're bringing in for a few years. And, and, we, and we don't know what the state's going to do, even with the, the new approved, the approved budget. Correct. So. Correct. Are there any other questions? From the board. You back with your work. Uh, in that case, uh, roll call, please. Drive board? Yes. Mr. Zach? Yes. Mrs. Audrey? Yes. Mr. Turner? Yes. Mr. White? Yes. And that brings us to new business. I need a motion for the consent item, please. Move to approve the consent items that have decided 5.1 5 to 5.13. I second that. Thank you. And I like that very I will. Yes, we have some more supplementals on there. Um, also, some alter coaches. One of those. Um, that's in solids. And the uh, class flight employment of the sodium that we jump into the cycle a few times here. Um, our food sale policy, the sale lines, uh, been a work for us to sell. Um, it's an access school, what it entails, cardio wise, and nutrition wise. So um, that's on there. That's something we do every year, also. Um, the unpaid leave is um, to classify staff. They, they already have it, but they're the two employees. Extended days springs Aaron, our middle school guidance counselor. Um, so the same as eight nine counselor and the same as high school counselor. Or excuse me, in blood, the high school counselor is one and she's ten. So um, this will bring her to ten and it will pull more clearly eight nine counselor. Um, the resignations there, a retirement, we're gonna gonna say goodbye to Jerry Jerry Pillich at the end of the year, his high school math teacher, great teacher. Um, every year I've been to the Forefront of dinner, he's where they bring back their students or their <coughs> teachers that they did for the last year. So, some of it um, is, is there. So, um, a great teacher, a great kid, great content, people we'll really miss him. Um, but excited for him that we're going to go to the next phase of life. Um, got a couple donations, and we have indoor track, which we do every year. Um, I love all kids. State and state championship when we do that. And the second reading of the graduation requirement policy that we went over last month. And that's it. Okay. Any questions? Is there a reason why we always have to do that indoor track? I mean, I would think we approve it once, it's part of our athletic program, that's that. I think it's just a, like a yearly, like a supplemental that we're probably proposing that always has like a asset to do with every year because we're going to the state. Any other questions? Now, is this a sport that we buy uniforms for? Or is it? Which is right. No. <laughs> we don't even uh, train sports to do it. It's not a varsity sport. Um, it's not but a varsity they need sport. our approval to take yeah, part in the bump. Is it more of a club? Like, I don't get it. I'm it's, sorry. <laughs> no, the difference. It kind of is a tree like club, but they need more approval to participate in the bump. 
Do we pay for a coach? We'll pay. We pay for a track coach, one of those indoor track coach. But we're not taking athletes. And they represent what they buy? Well, the track coach coaches the indoor track athletes as well, right? No. No, he just don't sell them all. So it's sort of hard. So this is not. I mean, coach may go and do things on their own time, but not formally. It's just for these athletes to compete. Right. Yeah. Any other questions? Is the graduation requirement separately or is this included? This is good. Yeah, no, it's included. There's a that is the second reading of this. Do any questions about that or who's here? Based on my presentation, I'll speak on that. No, I mean, it, it, this is basically just a big state requirement. Changing our requirements. We got to choose our local diplomas, right? Yes. Community I mean, service, arts, and student engagement. Yes. Right. Anything else? No, roll call, please. Mr. Osborne? Yes. Mr. Dunn? Yes. Mr. Sowery? Yes. Mr. Turner? Yes. Mr. White? Yes. And are there any discussion items from the board? No? No. Um, any public comments? Uh, uh, is there a reason for executive session? No, sir. Well, on this, we're adjourned yet. It's not over yet. Okay, then I need a motion to adjourn. Thank you. I move that we adjourn. I second. Thank you. Mr. Osborne, Mr. Turner? Yes. Mr. Dunn? Yes. Mr. Turner? Yes. Mr. White? Yes.